Hello and welcome to Exploring Jesus Ourselves. My name is Simonon and I'll be taking this unit, unit six, called Altered Images. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm going to be participating in the course as well as helping out with the ICT. Thank you, Megan. So this unit entitled Altered Images is about the way in which the image of Jesus has been changed, maybe dis distorted, maybe not as accurate as we imagine. So those are some of the issues that we're going to be looking at. So without further ado, let us bring up the first image, please. Yep. Uh, this is a painting by Velasquez. It's one of the commonest images of Jesus, Christ crucified. If we think of the whole of Jesus's life, his birth to his death, age 33, there's a significant number of paintings over the 2000 years, which are about Jesus as a baby, his birth, Madonna and child and so on. And there's a very long gap. We get to his period of teaching and healing, which was about three years. Of that period, the commonest painting is of his crucifixion. We consider for a moment some of the alternatives. For example, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is healing. Jesus is intervening against the public execution of a woman, for example. Various other important activities that he is placing. There are some paintings, but not very many. Most of them focus on this, his crucifixion. And that reflects, of course, the traditional Christian view of the purpose of his mission. And we looked at that in unit three, the cross and the sun. Now, it's an important point because one of the critics of modern media is that it is biased. And the bias, which incidentally may not be deliberate, quite often comes from not merely how something is reported but what is reported. So the fact that the bulk of paintings of Jesus over the last 2000 years are of his crucifixion portray a certain image of Jesus, the suffering Christ. And I may say this particular image uh, is relatively tame, some of them are positively drenched in blood. So the first thing about this image is what it's of, or what bit of Jesus's life it's of. Is that making sense? Yeah, that is making sense. And I think it resonates with me a lot what you said. All the images I feel like I've ever seen of Jesus have always been the birth, the death, and maybe one Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey um, but it's rarely anything else I can't think of any other images that I've seen um, and they always do seem to be so gruesome makes me wonder why there is this such fascination with the morbid gory pain centered imagery yeah it really comes from the middle ages a particular view of Jesus, his mission, and of suffering and mm. redemption. Um, but, and it's taken hold of the psychology of the Christian church. I absolutely agree with you that it's something that, that comes across. If we go back to the image just for a moment. Yep, one moment.
There's something else about the portrait. In reality, when somebody was crucified, they were crucified in the nude. It was part of the humiliation. Now, we can understand that Christian painters would not have wanted to expose our Lord's genitals uh, to the viewing public. It would have been seen as disrespectful. It went against cultural norms. Therefore, what they did was drape a kind of loincloth um, across the relevant area. And that was no doubt the conscious purpose behind covering up his genitals. But the byproduct of that was to also conceal a very obvious reminder that Jesus was Jewish because it concealed the fact that he'd been circumcised. So that that issue of covering up Jesus' Jewishness, in this case merely as a byproduct of following a cultural norm, becomes one of the themes that we're going to be looking at. So if I could possibly ask you to move on to the next slide, please. The de-Judification of Jesus, this covering up of his Jewishness. It's important to bear in mind that Jesus, 90% plus of his followers, and his opponents were Jewish. Of course they would be because they all came from what is now Israel in Galilee, Judea and so on. So it's no surprise that not only were all his support or Jewish source, so were his opponents. There would be Jews who might have thought he was the Messiah, there were Jews who thought he was a blasphemer. When it came to his trial, however, the way it is portrayed in the Bible is that the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who had the actual legal right to crucify somebody or not, literally washes his hands. And if you follow the biblical account, under pressure of a Jewish mob, agrees to have him crucified. Now we've already touched on the questions around this story. First of all, it was very uncharacteristic of a Roman governor, let alone Pontius Pilate, to give in uh, to public pressure from the Jews. Also, it's framed as to speak of the Jews, as if that was all Jews in Israel at the time, and indeed for all time. So the responsibility for Jesus' death shifted in the biblical account from the Romans to the Jews. That may be part of the process that the early Jesus movement was separating out into a distinct separate Christian religion. It may also be part of the process of trying to separate out at the time of the Jewish revolt against Roman rule. It would have made Christians more acceptable, Christianity more acceptable to the Romans if it didn't look like they were being blamed for the death of their founder. Now, we can't prove this. Uh, it's speculation. But if there is a question about the way that the trial, crucifixion of Jesus is portrayed. Where there isn't a question is the impact of this, because what emerges is this myth of Jews as Christ killers, all Jews, all time. And that was fed by the church. There were at intervals, massacres. Uh, Jews were expelled from 
different countries. They were expelled, for example, from England in the Middle Ages, expelled from Spain. There was discrimination, persecution, institutionalized anti Semitism. All this then fed and provided the fuel for the Holocaust. Now, obviously, the people who executed the Holocaust were Hitler and the Nazis. That's understood. But he and the Nazis received a degree of indifference, silence, collaboration, active help from some of the populations of Europe because they thought, basically, well, that's what the Jews deserve. Okay, so the myth of Jews as Christ killers is very potent and has had terrible consequences, and it's based on a lie, an incomplete picture which somehow portrays all of Jesus's opponents as Jewish, but not his supporters or indeed Jesus himself. And then during the course of my research, I came across this prayer that was used by the Roman Catholic Church on Black Friday service, right up until 1956. That's beyond the Holocaust itself. And it contains these extraordinary words. Let us pray also for the perfidious Jews. Perfidious, treacherous, dishonest. Um, they pray to almighty eternal God who does not exclude from thy mercy even the perfidious Jews. It's extraordinary. But there we are, 1956. I may say since that the Roman Catholic Church uh, has done a great deal to try and mend bridges. Uh, but it's deep within the Christian movement. Martin Luther, the founder of what became Protestant, Protestantism, uh, was a violent anti-Semite. Um, so with honourable exceptions, uh, anti-Semitism, religious anti-Semitism, became very much part of, of church thinking and culture. The irony is that so much of Christianity is essentially reformed Judaism. So much of it is built on the Jewish faith. Even a ceremony like baptism is actually a Jewish ceremony. You may recall in the Bible, John, John the Baptist was baptizing Jews. Baptism is part of the conversion ceremony of somebody who is becoming Jewish and also as it was in the case of John the Baptist people are moving from one school of Judaism to another so that's a Jewish ritual and even at the end of prayer Christians tend to say Amen which is from the Jewish Amen same word so on the one hand we have the deepest roots including the identity of Jesus of Christianity in the Jewish faith and on the other the sort of split um, where Jesus is portrayed as somehow not Jewish and the most vivid example of this in contemporary times is Jesus Christ Superstar. It started off as a film in the 70s in which Jesus is, is selected as a fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, all intents and purposes, all American guy. And the high priests who were from exactly the same ethnic group as Jesus have a characteristic Middle Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean, olive skin, black hair. You would never guess they were from exactly uh, the same country uh, looking at the film and of course the, the the musicals and, and whatnot since then. I'm not suggesting incidentally 
it's almost deliberately anti-Semitic, but what it was, was continuing a certain stereotype. So if you saw Jesus Christ superstar, you'd never think Jesus was Jewish or even Middle Eastern. Is that making sense? Yeah, I'm just shocked by how that um, that prayer was used up until 1956. It's, I just I can't I can't get my head around how that could be possibly used so so soon after the Holocaust. Um, and like the, the, hypo, hypo, uh, the hypocrisy of using the um, Amen, using the baptism, and yet still having this awful behaviour towards the Jewish culture. It really, it's, it's striking, really, <laughs> that they, they can they can do that. Um, and also the pure, how illogical it is to portray somebody as fair-skinned, blonde hair, blue eyes, when clearly they're from the Middle East. It's really, I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah. So that's one aspect of altered images, okay, to the extent to which the de-judification of Jesus has altered his image. Very close to that is the Europeanization of Jesus. And from that, if I could possibly ask you to move to the next slide, please. Okay. Yes. Okay. So here is the world in the time of Jesus. On the left hand side, in a sort of terracotta colour, you can see the Roman Empire. Now, on the right of the Roman Empire, down a little bit, you should be able to see a sort of star there. That's it. That's Jerusalem. It's our starting point. Now, communications within the Roman Empire were relatively good, good road communications and indeed sea communications. And it meant that Jesus's ideas spread, could spread relatively quickly. So from the starting point in Jerusalem, some of them moved to Rome itself, to Italy and, and to Rome itself. We know that there were Christians in Rome, indeed, something mentioned earlier um, in the 60s there were being blamed for fires in Rome by Nero the Emperor Nero and then again making use of the communication system within the Roman Empire we know that Christian ideas moved to North Africa so if we follow the southerly trade route we get first to Egypt a lot of uh, Christians uh, in Egypt, the Coptic church in Egypt, a very ancient church, and of course throughout the Middle East, because that's where it would spread first of all. And then following that trade route further down, we come to another star, and that's Aksum. Aksum is in the northern part of Ethiopia. Ethiopia was one of the first countries to become Christian, early fourth century. And the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, therefore, is one of the most ancient. Then if we carry on with the trade route eastwards, and then southeastwards, we end up in southwest India, Kerala, where there has been a Christian, indigenous Christian community for many hundreds of years, possibly thousands of years. Local tradition says that St. Thomas, one of the 12 apostles, traveled there after Jesus's death and founded an indigenous church. What we can say for certain, it's hundreds of years old. And when the Portuguese turned up uh, in 15th, 16th century, starting to trade, they were astonished to discover there were already Christians there. And then if we go back to Jerusalem just for a moment and now take the northerly trade route through the Parthian Empire, that is now roughly Iran, up through Sogdia, 
And now this path you're following is the old Silk Road. And along the Silk Road, Christian communities were set up. Nestorian Christians. They were set up. China, um, elsewhere, Central Asia. So that Christianity began life, essentially, as a Middle Eastern, African, and Asian religion. Some Christianity reached the European provinces of Europe, like um, France and um, Spain, because they were part of the Roman Empire. But then, of course, the empire collapsed. There was a conversion, 6th, 7th, 8th century, depending a little bit where it was in Europe. So these countries didn't become Christian until several hundred years after the Christian communities were set up in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia. What is surprising is you'd never guess if you looked at modern Christianity. But before I go on any further, over to you, Megan, about your thoughts on this. Yeah, I've always, in my head, Christianity has been a predominantly European, well, a British religion. Um, I've never really thought of it as going outside Europe, really. But having those maps of the trade routes along them, it really helps to see how that message would have spread and how it would have spread to all other countries before it even got to Britain. Um, so, yeah, it's a really useful resource to have, is that map. So how on earth did we get to that place which you quite accurately described, and I think most people would agree with you, that somehow Christianity and Europe are almost synonymous? Let's look at the next slide, please. <laughs> One second. Here we go. Essentially what happened was that various European countries that became Christian later than the Middle East, Africa, Asia. Round about 1500, became very powerful economically, militarily, politically. They began to expand. Spain and Portugal conquered parts of South and Central America. Spain and Portugal explored East Africa, Portugal to India, then the British, then the French. And as they expanded, as they started to create colonies, create empires, they exported with them their own religion. Uh, in some cases, they came to countries where Christianity was unknown. So if we take, for example, the English in North America, and we can see a picture on the right hand side there, the bottom right hand side there, the indigenous Americans were unfamiliar. And those that weren't exterminated uh, were sometimes uh, spoken to, reached out, converted. Um, sometimes, as the Portuguese found, they got to India, and we can see the picture there of, you notice, brown skinned Indian Christians. They found a religion already there. An indigenous Christian religion already there. Needless to say, they decided that their version of Christianity, which in the Portuguese case was Catholicism, was the right one. So very often these unfortunates found themselves pressurized or worse into converting. Similarly, when the British turned up uh, in India later on, 18th, 19th century, 
they also decided that their version of Christianity was the superior one because it was European, because it was fair skinned. Um, and the fact that there was already an indigenous Christian movement in India, can't realize at all. Uh, the general view was that these were the heathens living in darkness and they required the light of European civilization. So what you then get is that firstly, Jesus then becomes Europeanized. Christianity becomes part of the toolkit of European imperialism. And it therefore arguably becomes tainted with greed, racism, barbarity of the European conquerors. Uh, to be fair, to many European missionaries were quite sincere in what they were doing. Some people, of course, uh, used Christianity as a convenient cover for their plans of conquest and commercial exploitation. But undoubtedly, there were some very brave, sincere missionaries who sacrificed a great deal, sometimes their lives, in order to spread the mission. But it was entangled with the wider question of European imperialism. Interestingly, Ethiopia, and we can see an Ethiopian service up there on the top right, one of the oldest countries to become Christian, managed to maintain its independence during the colonial period. They were briefly conquered by the Italians, not very effectively during the Second World War, but for most of its very long history, Ethiopia has been an independent African country, and from the early first century, fourth century, sorry, the, a Christian country, following its own particular version of of Christianity. So again, going back to the question of altered images, the Europeanization of Jesus has been one of the most profound. Any thoughts, feedback, questions on that? I can really see how the um image of Jesus and the Jesus's mission would have been so tainted by if these missionaries were coming over and in such a condescending and almost in, is an insulting and dangerous way spreading the message with their message of Jesus along with all the violent antics at the same time how the Christian message could be so skewed and altered from what maybe the original intention was or from what it should be um so i can see how it wouldn't have been well received indeed indeed okay now the third issue around altered images is to do with patriarchy and womankind so if we could move to the next slide please i can Now, in the traditional Christian teaching, the story goes like this. Jesus selected 12 male apostles to do his work. And because he selected 12 male apostles, therefore, the priesthood should also be male. Now, that line of argument has got some flaws in, it in itself, but I want to start off by saying, is that model, we have Jesus, 12 males, that's it, that's the whole story. Has some bits been airbrushed out? For example, in some gospels, particularly the ones that didn't make it into the Bible, the role of what you might call an inner circle of three women 
around Jesus is very important. So if we look at the Gospel of St. Philip, it says, there were three who always walked with the Lord, Mary his mother and her sister, and Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. His sister and his mother and his companion were each Mary. And in the Gospel of Mary, there's a debate about the role of women. Uh, this is present on Mary, Peter, that's St. Peter, and Levi, one of Jesus' followers. And this comes the moment in which, in the scriptural account, Jesus has resurrected and appeared to two women, one of which is Mary Magdalene, and she is reporting the story of his appearance coming back from the dead to Peter, who initially just scoffs at it. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? And at which point Levi replies, if the Saviour made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Saviour knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. So if you look at these accounts, and indeed the references in the canonical Gospels, the Gospels in the Bible, we have a quite different image here. We have Jesus working very closely with women. And in the early Jesus movement, the early Christian church, we know that elements, and particularly the Gnostic church, the Gnostic groups, it's one of the three sort of broad groupings in the early Christian church, the Gnostics used women as priests. We know this because the more kind of mainstream conservative Christians were outraged. Here we have Tertullian, a Christian writer from North Africa in the second century. As for the women of the heretics, how forward they are. They have the impudence to teach, to argue, to perform exorcisms, to promise cures, perhaps even to baptize. And incidentally, we know that went on for several centuries because there were conservatives in the church complaining about it. What's important is to understand, therefore, that women were prominent in the early Christian church. I might add in parentheses, the same thing is true in the early Islamic movement. Um, we get mystics like Rabia Basra, for example, who tremendously influential. But what happened over the centuries is the conservative patriarchal uh, view of religion became the dominant force and women were excluded from the priesthood and indeed it's only very recently and only in some Christian churches that that's come back. Um, there are incidentally honourable exceptions. I'll put a plug for the Quakers at this point, who, where women spoke at Quaker meetings for many hundreds of years, but it's interesting they're very unorthodox Christians. So to what extent then has Jesus' image and actual behaviour been altered to serve the interests of a patriarchal view of Christianity. Is this a case that's happened in so many other areas of history where women just get airbrushed out and a different version of history, his story, rather than her story, is the one that's told? I'm going to look at a very specific example in a moment, but before I do that, I just wanted to see if you had any questions or comments 
Um, as a woman, absolutely, this has had a huge impact on my relationship with any exploration of Jesus. I think from an early child going to Church of England Primary School and it would always be the story of Jesus was taught to me by men um, and it would always be from a man's perspective and it would always be about the men in Jesus's life. The only woman ever mentioned was Mary's mother and if Mary Magdalene was mentioned it was kind of like oh don't talk about her. Um, so to have to know about the him was walking with three women and for them to be such an important part of his life it's really empowering as a woman to have that knowledge and to be confident in an exploration of Jesus knowing that actually Jesus's relationship with women was probably a lot different to everything I've ever heard and been told about and it's really it makes me want to explore Jesus more to have that understanding of how he was with women his views and yeah, I just find it really empowering. And notice that it's the Gospels that didn't make it into the Bible that contain that information, and that's because they were deemed Gnostic, therefore heretic, and that was suppressed. So if you're interested in, in, in women and their role, I would definitely have a look at some of the Gnostic Gospels, sadly mostly only in fragments, but it's mm. very interesting that those fragments that do survive present a very different image. There is no question that, that women were prominent, as I say, because <laughs> the critics are complaining about it. So we know, we know. It's a, women being in their spiritual power is the earlier tradition. It's not some PC modern trend. It's the original tradition, at least of one strand of the Jesus movement. And it are, it, <clears throat> these texts argue actually Jesus himself, that his closest companions were women, not men. Okay, so we move on to one of many cases even the name is controversial because a woman mystic has come down to us as Julian of Norwich. And if you could possibly show the last slide, please. We don't know what her name was. She was a nun. She lived in the 14th century. She lived during the Black Death. She had a series of mystical visions of Jesus. And they were very different from Orthodox Christianity. If we just read the first one, and all should be well, and all should be well, and all manner of things should be exceeding well. It's very up. And she wrote this during the Black Death. Tremendous faith in the, in the future. And then, as truly as God is our father, so truly is God our mother. Okay? And see how controversial this is. And then between God and the soul, there is no in between. What does that say about the church hierarchy and the need for priests? Um, it's lucky this stuff survived. It comes in the book of Revelations of Divine Love. It's, it's, it's medieval, and you can tell when you read it, it's written in a in that in that. Uh, well within that world view but it is an amazing book it's really interesting she's one of a number of women mostly nuns some of them ended up burnt sometimes it was the books were burnt um, the appalling history 
of the suppression of women's spiritual power, spiritual gifts, spiritual calling. It's not only, of course, damaged women, but it's damaged everybody because their insights, and here's an example, are often so very different. They're not um, party line stuff. They're very often mystical. Sometimes they're quite sensual. They're alive. So what I would encourage anybody who is interested in this question of Jesus and womankind is to read some of these. I mean, so I suggested one revelation of divine love, but there are many. There are many of these. Uh, I mentioned the Quakers of the 17th century and onwards who provided a space where women could express their spirituality, viciously persecuted and tortured for doing so by the mainstream Christian authorities. The other group worth mentioning, and again interesting to explore, are the Cathars of the Middle Ages. Uh, their religion, which could be described as a version of Christianity, spread along the Balkans, northern Italy, southern France. Now there they had a priesthood called Parfait, perfect ones, and both men and women uh, preached. They lived very simple lives, the lives of the original apostles. A crusade was launched against them and they were eventually exterminated. Unlike their male counterparts, not a single woman Cathar priest recounted. Not one. Interesting. Some of the men did. None of the women did. They all went to the stake. Um, or had faced a lifetime in prison rather than uh, denounce their faith. So Catharism gave a, a voice to women. And indeed, it's one of the things the church strenuously objected to. Um, this idea that women should be given their spiritual voice. There is a long history, therefore, I would say, of the suppression of women's spirituality. So, There's a very profound altered image. It's part of the story of discovering Jesus. It's not just how Jesus was when he was alive, but how he has come down to us. Non-Jewish, European, a supporter of patriarchy. There are challenges to all those altered images. Um, people can have their own views. The church is uh, quite able to defend itself. In some cases, like the Church of England is now starting to embrace a uh, woman priesthood. So there's an evolution going on, undoubtedly. But it's a, it's quite a story. So before we conclude, do you have any concluding thoughts, questions, comments? Um, it's striking how positive that uh, message from Julian is. Yeah. It's so uplifting and you can feel the, the love and the, the happiness in the words. And for me, with my experiences of anything to do with Jesus in the past, it's such a contrast to any messages beforehand it seems yeah. so vibrant and alive and it's something i want to read it's something i want to explore whereas other things beforehand it's always been a bit like oh i don't really want to go too much into that i don't want to get myself down whereas reading things like that it's so i, I want to learn more i want to explore it more i want to embrace it yeah well worth a read well worth a read so um, if it's encouraged you, great. And, and I entirely share your view of the importance 
when we explore Jesus, explore all of it, and particularly the stories that have been airbrushed out. Uh, and that seems to me is one of the opportunities of this course. Come to whatever conclusion you like, but at least have a look at the story and particularly that those voices that were silenced for so long, the voice of womankind. On that note, I will say goodbye from me. Goodbye. Hopefully see you next week. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. <laughs>